I'm Enzo Tedeschi. I am a writer, producer, editor, and um, moving into director as well at the moment, so uh, wear many hats. My first job in the industry was uh, as in, was actually not even in film, it was in TV. I was an assistant editor at uh, a travel show for, for a, a major network here. So I learned a lot actually about hitting deadlines and knowing which corners to cut and, and, and still not have something that felt like it had corners cut uh, at the end of the day. So, um, and, and through that started building a network of people and meeting people. And uh, in fact, that's where I met uh, Julian Harvey, who's been my business partner for several years now. So Airlock came out of a conversation that Jules and I were having about, um, well, we wanted, we wanted to do something in the science fiction space. and. Uh, Trying, it initially started as probably most of our conversations do about finding something that was quite contained and simple and that you know could be achieved relatively simply on a low budget. They're usually a lot of the boxes we try and tick when we conceive of something. Um, and science fiction, I, I think science fiction works really, really well when it's got something to say. So you're not just telling a story about oh, spaceships and aliens and cool stuff. Um, it had there's something underneath that that's uh, an extra layer of subtext that has something to say, almost like on a social commentary level. Uh, so I think Airlock didn't really click until we found what that was going to be, and from there it sort of snowballed. By the time we hit production, it was. Uh, an unwieldy beast. Um, as some of these, sometimes these things just tend to grow and grow and grow, and that's yeah. I think with the writing of Airlock, uh, you know, every, any project I do, I'm always aware of the marketplace in terms of you know what's an audience watching, what do people like to watch. I guess the the benefit there for me is that I'm always trying to make the kind of content that I would like to watch, so I feel like there's a built-in check there. Um, the writing process on Airlock had a couple of evolutions, however, so Jules and I started with the first few drafts of, of the episodes and uh, we always, once we got a, a director on board with Mark Fermi, um, we always give our directors a, a pass over the script to you know, just kind of bring their own voice to what they're doing. I think that always makes a lot of sense to do that with a, with a creative person. We're always open for collaboration and so Mark and his usual um, co-writer Cheyenne came on board and did a few passes of the script and it actually that was like a, a second evolution of the project it actually changed uh, significantly uh, at that writing stage um, but I think at the end of the day there's still always going to be something there that an audience is going to want to see because otherwise it's just not worth pressing the button on production if that's not the case do you know what I mean? Like you've got to make content to some degree for an audience. Even if it's a small audience, I think you need to know who you're trying to target something at. Well, there was no locations. There was one location um, because we shot it all in an empty warehouse in Gladesville. So uh, everything you see is sets, um, except for the little bit of exterior stuff, which was shot on a quarry down uh, south of Sydney. But, um, you know, I've, uh, I've been quite good friends with Matt Graham and, and Shana Best for quite some time now. And uh, as they were coming off of the end of Infinity's production, and I walked in to visit them and there was all these sets that were about to get basically skipped, you know, broken down and thrown away. And I was like, you guys aren't shooting anything here for months and we're about to go into production why don't we come in here and you know hire the studio space office and instead of throwing all this stuff or all these materials away um, just leave them for us we're not going to reuse your sets but we can certainly reuse the materials and build our own using that because our entire art department budget including wages at the moment wouldn't even cover the amount of material you're about to throw away so um, <clears throat> there was some back and forth there and obviously they were a little bit sensitive about the production design aspect of it but um, once we assured them that we weren't going to rip them off, um, which was great. So, so yeah, it was a huge boon to the production to be able to have all of that material to sort of reshape and turn into what we needed. I think the biggest challenge on Airlock was just the scale of the project versus the budget that we had, right? So we got funded for a certain shape of story that, you know, with a particular production rationale and then it kind of evolved into this thing that didn't really fit inside that box anymore, but we really wanted to make. So we, we kind of, I mean, we shot ourselves in the foot a little bit there on that one. So we were always ambitious with our budgets. Um, 
this one probably more so than usual. So uh, yeah, just just the the number of people required for you know uh, pulling together that number of sets and you know extras and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it's the biggest thing that I've ever probably uh, done as a producer, um, and the. The, the, the budget was just not big enough, you know, but you've got, there's such a passionate filmmaking community that gets so excited about working on things that are uh, of a genre, especially science fiction, because so, so, so little of it happens here uh, in Sydney in particular, um, that people just went above and beyond, you know. I found, I was, I was telling somebody else this recently, that I found myself in a position where I was telling people to go home just going, you have to go home now. You've got, you like, end of the day. And they would always be pushing me harder. And going, no, no, I just want to just hang on. I can just do a little bit more and a little bit more. It's like, you can't, you can't buy that kind of enthusiasm and loyalty um, in any way. So we we're lucky to have a team of people that were really behind the project as well. So financially, the project was funded predominantly by Screen Australia's uh, multi-platform drama department and uh, Distracted Media sort of put up the rest either in cash or kind. Uh, but the total budget roughly works out to about $600,000 for the series, and that's three episodes of around about 20 minutes each. So Airlock has a quite a big scale look, um, and we didn't have a lot of money to achieve that. So uh, again, it comes back to that notion I was saying before about knowing where you can cut some corners and not feel like you're cutting corners. So there was a production rationale um, and a style that we had to sort of impose on, on the director and, and on the crew, which was, you know, there's a lot of handheld moving camera and stuff like that, which uh, I think almost the entire show is handheld or steady cam, um, purely because it enables you to run a lot faster, you know, um, the, on, on set. So a lot of the set, uh, because we had, we were able to get so many of those materials to reuse, we had a set that was of a scale that was bigger than we had anticipated. So it meant that we were able to pre-light a lot of that and just have actors walking through sets and moving around and you know not have to stop and reset lights. Do you know what I mean? So you know when we were on the Kiev, we were on the Kiev uh, spacecraft. So any one, any section of that spacecraft or any one of those rooms that came off of that set were pretty much good to go. Um, so if we were like, oh, we're in there now, we could pick up and move to the other side of the ship and not have to wait for the entire lighting setup necessarily. So uh, yeah, that and, and again, you know, striking deals whereby you're able to, you know, reuse a bunch of materials that are getting ditched, which is always, I, I find it really, really wasteful at the end of a, a project where you see all these sets always being thrown away. I mean, I understand it's necessary. You can't always keep everything all the time, but there's no need, there's no reason why that stuff can't find a second lease on life in another way. So when we made the tunnel, we did a crowdfunding campaign whereby we sold a frame, uh, frame by frame of the film. We pre-sold before the film was even made at a dollar a piece. Uh, and that sort of gave us enough money to get out there and, and shoot the film and, and, and get it done. So. The, what we did learn from that experience, though, is also that by getting people involved at that early stage, we were able to sort of build a, an audience at the same time that were responding to the content. So when it came f down to Airlock, we, uh, we did give another crowdfunding campaign a shot. Um, and, and it did work. I mean, we managed to get about, I think it was about thirty or $40,000 in pledges but um, having used a platform that was an all or nothing strategy um, and setting our target very ambitiously, we fell short of that. Um, so, but, the, but we did, I, I can see just by the names on that campaign and, and the number of people that did pledge that people are interested in the project. We did reach a new audience, I think, that we didn't reach when we did the tunnel crowdfunding campaign. There was a, a whole new kind of uh, audience member that was sort of floating around that we weren't used to seeing. Um, and I guess that's the difference between doing a horror film and doing a science fiction film. They often overlap, but they don't always. So, um, you know, it, it was, even though it was failed, uh, a failed campaign in terms of we didn't get the money from the campaign, I think it was still uh, of use because we were able to generate a whole bunch of attention around the project that we would otherwise not have had. So Airlock 
was funded and is inherently at its core an online series. It was always intended that way and that's how it will go out. Um, and we will be focusing on an online release. So the exact details of that are still being kind of worked out at the moment, but the general principle is we'll probably go out with an episode that will be freely available and shareable to everybody and then put a whole bunch of not only the other two episodes but a whole bunch of um, uh, bonus uh, content behind a paywall of some description. So it's ge that's the general, loosely speaking, the formula that we're going with. So Dead House Films came about uh, because of a few factors. Uh, one of which is that, you know, I mean, um, I've been working on every project since the tunnel um, with my co-producer and co-creator Julian Harvey. Um, we're kind of both pursuing personal projects at the moment, so going our own separate ways temporarily. And um, so I needed something that wasn't distracted media to be able to funnel that stuff through. So that's one, one factor. The other factor is that on a, almost on a weekly basis uh, in 2015, I've been getting phone calls or emails from independent filmmakers who are saying, well, I've just made my film or I've just made my series or I'm just about to and, you know, can I come and pick your brain about how is this all going to work and how do we do it? And I was seeing a lot of really, really great content that was being turned away by the bigger, more traditional kind of uh, uh, distributors. Uh, and probably in some ways rightly so because the way that they know how to release a film, this content's not going to be successful for them. Um, I would have made the same decision in their, in their shoes. But I, it, it occurred to me that these people needed help <laughs> in, in trying to find uh, an audience for their content. So um, it's when I started thinking about, well, you know, the, the things that I was going to have to build and put in place for the release of Airlock and the other projects that we've got coming up. And I thought, well, I should just open that up and make that available to other quality content that fits within the stable of that sci-fi horror kind of so it's a niche but there's no shortage of content um, and, and, and a lot of it's actually really good content so you know there's a bunch of factors that combine plus the the the, the current climate you know with ev like I feel like this year finally the, not only the audience, but the industry feels like it's finally catching up to digital strategies. You know, the, 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 the kind of stuff I've been talking about since the tunnel, which is like 2011 now, it's been four years. And I feel like finally everybody's catching up to what I was trying to push uphill then. Now I'm struggling to keep up with because, you know, it, there's, a, there's a massive snowball effect that's happening in that whole, um, that whole space. There's a problem with the statement that people can sometimes make where, you know, a film has benefited from piracy. I think that, that, that doesn't really make sense in that, you know, nothing benefits from any kind of theft. Like it's just, it's illegal, so you should, we shouldn't be doing it, or no one should be doing it. Um, but it's also, I think, not accurate to say that for every illegal download is a lost sale. I don't think that those numbers necessarily add up either. And the only way for us to really fight piracy, uh, or because or, or, yeah, we're never going to eliminate it, I don't think, but the only way for us to really fight it on any level that is meaningful is just to make it as redundant as possible. So what does that mean? It means making it as available as possible in as many ways as possible to anyone who would want to consume it and not try and create these artificial windows that don't work in a digital space, or geo-blocking, which is simple to circumvent, or you know, you know, cop even copyright protection. While I understand the idea, it, it's th there's nothing that it's so easy to circumvent that it feels just almost like a bit of a waste of time. It's not, but you see what I'm getting at. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> so yeah. The only way to fix it is to just make the process of piracy unnecessary because then the only people left doing it will probably be the really heavy duty ones that we're not going to stop by sending, you know, cease and desist letters from an ISP. They're the guys we're going to want to stop. And then we can target on, you know, focus on stopping those guys because they're the ones doing damage. Um, the real damage anyway, or the significant damage. Marketing is critical to any 
product, let alone a film. It's just, it's the, the way by which you create an awareness for what you're trying to sell. So it's critical and it's very important. However, I think more than ever now, the theatrical space is very, very crowded. Um, at the end of the day, the, when, when you're talking about marketing, the winner is the person that gets to shout the loudest, right? That gets to cut through the noise by having, having the loudest voice. As an independent filmmaker, you're never going to be able to compete on a level uh, that you know the latest Avengers movie is going to have in terms of the marketing push behind it. Um, they're going to be everywhere all the time and everyone's going to want to know about them because they're everywhere all the time and the amount of money that's been spent on the film and the value of the property and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very challenging space to, to you know, it's, a, you, it's, it's, it's David and Goliath really. So you, as indies, you kind of need to take a, a slightly different tack, I think, and, and use, you know, some people would see that scenario as a liability. I think if you look at what the liability is and try and turn it into an asset for yourself, there's actually a way of marketing independent films which will cut through the noise because what you, but, but what you need to do is not try and shout the loudest and the furthest from the rooftops and try and reach everybody's ears in the hope that you'll find somebody that's interested in your film. It's actually the opposite of that. You need to focus on finding where the people are that would be interested in your film and then putting it in front of them, which is a, it's a, it's completely opposite to the traditional way of doing it, which is like, here it is, and now let's get everybody, as many as people as possible to look at it. It's like, no, 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 let's find where the people are first. You're all interested in that kind of stuff. Great, here's what I've got. It, it, and, and that's far simpler and far cheaper, <laughs> um, but it, it, it is a, a fairly significant shift in thinking. So uh, that's why I think a lot of filmmakers struggle with it because online marketing is very, very different because um, really when we're talking about an independent film, nine times out of ten we're talking about online marketing, that, that's a very different approach to what we've been traditionally taught is the way that you market a film. And neither of them are wrong. Um, it's just, you know, you, you need to make a, 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 a judicious evaluation of what's right for each film. There's no one size fits all anymore, I don't think. I don't know that it's necessarily any more difficult to engage an Australian audience than it is anywhere else in the world with a piece of content. I think the key comes to creating content that is, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, you know, as universally desirable as possible, right? There's, there's always a big, a big, big market for decently produced science fiction, right? It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, I don't know, interstellar for it to, you know, uh, but it does have to be of a quality but it doesn't have to be that to reach an audience. But Australian audiences do flock to that kind of content. So it would make sense that if you created something that was that, the Australian audiences would respond to it. Do you know what I mean? So it, it's, I think sometimes we, and, and I, I'm guilty of it as well when, when you know, in development or whatever, you can get lost in making films that don't necessarily have a, an audience. That's not to say that people won't like them, but if, you, if you're developing something from the ground up which is completely developed in a bubble without a second thought to how it's going to sell, then you're really compromising the, the ability for that film to have a life. And career-wise, you may be compromising your, your own ability to have a career because no, it's a hard, it's, it becomes harder and harder to get a film up with every lack of success you know um, whereas if you have something successful it's got, it gets easier and easier so um, and, and I don't like being as cynical as some of the you know some of the tentpole stuff that we see on screens at the moment it's a very cynical ploy at, at finding a particular or, or exploiting a particular audience I think there's a middle ground to be found where you can still make something that's personal and meaningful and all of those wonderful things but that the audience, on the other hand, is also going to respond to. It's somewhere in the middle. And that, that's the trick, I think, of making a successful film.